All right. Uh, so why is it looking like that? There we go. We have Alex Chamberlain here. He is a seven-time Fantasy Sports uh, Writer Award nominee, two times winner, including Baseball Writer of the Year, the creator of the Pitch Leaderboard, and frequent contributor to Rotographs, the man that no shirts can contain. You can find him on Twitter at Dolph Hall Hagen. How do you pronounce that, Alex? Hall Hagen. Hall Hagen. That's pretty good. <laughs> the one, the only Alex Chamberlain. Welcome. Thank you so much for uh, participating in PitchCon. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks for thinking that I'm worthy of trying to help you raise money for charity. I'll probably get people to take back their donations, after this <laughs> one, but hopefully, hopefully that doesn't happen. So I, I'm sure everyone is is uh, disappointed. I don't know if they were placing bets on if you're wearing a shirt or not. I had this originally titled as shirtless advice by Alex <laughs> Chamberlain, but uh, look at that. He is wearing a shirt. Why are you wearing a shirt? Uh, so. People ask me that frequently. Um, <laughs> it's like 71 degrees right now. Mm. And I think the threshold for being able to wear a sweater is like 72. Um, so anytime it's even remotely chilly, like even just the slightest bit, I'll find an excuse to wear a sweater. So probably within the next like 20 minutes, it's going to become too hot for it. Um, mm. So there is like, you know, there's a non-zero chance that I there's a, a little bit of a, a show in the middle of my show here. Um, that, but, I mean, you know, no guarantees. I, I think everyone would be down for that. I think that would be very on brand, Chamberlain. But uh, without any further ado, uh, of course, everybody, uh, if you can go to support us at go.rallyup.com slash pitcherless, 50% of everything that we raise is going to Feeding America. So it's for a great cause. It's so that we can also continue to do things like this moving forward. But without anything else, uh, Alex, I'm going to let you take it away with your fantastic presentation. Cool. Um, yeah. So ERA estimators, uh, past, present, and future. Um, right. So I just wanted to, um, I kind of want to do like a high level thing on ERA estimators. You know, we're talking about like FIP, XFIP, Sierra, um, kind of just go over them in a way, uh, that maybe some people can better understand them. I think we all fundamentally understand what their purpose is, but not necessarily the assumptions. Hi, Jill. No worries. Um, the, the the assumptions that go into them, um, and also looking beyond those three to see um, you know what else there is in the in the landscape of of ERA estimators. Um, I think there's some interesting work being done, um, and I think there's more interesting work to be done eventually that has not been done, um, and we will get to what that might eventually look like. Hence, uh, the future. So let us get started. Hopefully, I don't screw this up cool um yeah so table of contents or whatever um past looking at the uh the you know revisiting and comparing some old school estimators um also familiarizing ourselves with some new school estimators and then looking into the future um which has not happened yet so we'll do our best to see what that might look like cool screwed this up that was quick what's going on there we go okay cool the past um oh my god um Cool. Let's, let's start with FIP. Um, this is like maybe one of the most basic ERA estimators, one of the big three you could say that I already mentioned. Um, FIP stands for Fielding Independent Pitching. Um, we know that it is supposed to estimate ERA. That is kind of the fundamental purpose. But what makes it different from all of the other ERA estimators? Well, you can find out basically what it assumes or implies by looking at its formula. Um, the formula can be confusing for some people. Um, for others, it might be a little more intuitive. But basically, um, it says that you incorporate home runs, uh, walks, hits by pitch, uh, and strikeouts. Um, you assign to them specific weights based on basically their value uh, to ERA. Uh, and you can, therefore, estimate ERA. Um, what these specific variables imply though in their incorporation in FIP is that strikeouts, walks, and home runs are really the only skills that a pitcher owns. So uh, anything that is kind of, um, uh, I don't know a good word for this, but maybe just independent of these. So anything like BABIP, um, what other, I'm trying to think of other things that might affect um, you know, like any kind of like hard hit rate, any other kind of like peripheral metric that might influence a pitcher's performance, it's really not accommodated here. It's effectively assumed that 
it is league average and that it will always regress back to league average. So um, if a pitcher has a 270 BABIP against, um, it's assumed basically that it will regress back to 300 or that his true talent level in terms of allowing a BABIP is 300 or whatever the league average is. I think it's about 295. And that's like that's kind of a faulty assumption a little bit, I think, because uh, we know that there are certain guys who beat and fail to beat um, the league average consistently. Marco Estrada was a guy back in the day. Matt Cain was a guy back in the day who would consistently drum up like BABIPs that are 240 and 250. And FIP is going to be something that um, fundamentally underestimates someone who is able to beat part of the equation that is assumed to be league average. Um, so it's most useful for, or it's, oh, I'm sorry, it's most useful purpose, FIPS, most useful purpose is um, to describe past performance. That's kind of like if you're going to use it for anything, um, whether you're describing past performance or predicting future performance, it is definitely um, better in a backward looking um, descriptive capacity. Um, and that's what I mean by deserve. If I ever say deserve in this, um, this PowerPoint, uh, when I say deserve, I mean we're looking backward um, in a descriptive capacity to say what he deserved previously based on what happened as opposed to uh, what he should deserve moving forward. And I think that's a distinction that I wish the industry would make better in terms of descriptive, predictive, deserved, expected, whatever, all of this taxonomy that we use to describe ERA and and all sorts of other things that we are trying to predict. Um, I wish we would do a better job of delineating that. So I just want to be clear that when I say deserve, I mean I'm, I'm looking uh, backward when I, when I talk about that. So again, FIP's most useful purpose is looking backward. And that's because home runs are treated as an ownable skill. And there's proof to an extent that, that home runs are not really an ownable skill. And that is kind of what XFIP, expected FIP, um, kind of stipulates. Um, is that strikeouts and walks are legit, but home run rate is not really something that we can predict from year to year. And if you try to correlate home runs to fly balls, and that's home run, home runs, uh, or I'm sorry, home run, whoa, I've never, have I said this out loud? Home run to fly ball rate? Anyway, the ratio of home runs to fly balls, that's a pretty common metric that we all use. Um, if you try to correlate that year over year, um, it's a very weak correlation, uh, at least from pitcher to pitcher. Um, and that has been evidence enough to suggest that FIP is short-sighted in its attribution of skills to home runs. So what XFIP does is it basically replaces home runs with fly balls. Fly balls is something that pitchers can own a little better um, based on their pitch mix, based on um, where they spot their pitches. You're going to inherently allow different launch angles uh, based on the way that this, even his his, uh, his release point, anything, uh, is going to allow fundamentally different launch angles that results in more fly balls, fewer fly balls. Um, and kind of using that assumption, um, because home run to fly ball rate is so volatile, you can just use the league average home run fly ball rate. Kind of just assume that that is the part that regresses back to the league average uh, and the fly balls are the ownable skill. With that in mind, XFIP's most, most useful purpose actually becomes predicting future performance. If we're going to compare FIP to XFIP, you actually want to use XFIP um, if you're trying to use it in some predictive manner, which we usually are. Looking back, if you're going to say, based on this pitcher's past 100 innings, um, you know how should he have pitched? XFIP is not superior to FIP in that capacity. If you want to say what a guy should have done in the past 100 innings, you should probably rely on FIP. Um, we do kind of conflate these uh, uh, kind of these notions because we need to look at past performance to predict future performance. So we are inclined to say, well, based on these past 100 innings, maybe he will perform this way in the next 100 innings. Um, so there really isn't necessarily a, a right or wrong way to do this, but just for everyone's kind of familiarization with these metrics, XFIP is not going to correlate as well with ERA um, in a backward sense. But if you're trying to look forward, you know, maybe in the next, maybe in the next hundred innings or maybe in the next year of, of that person's performance, um, you'll get, you're going to want to use XFIP instead. Again, XFIP like FIP 
is going to assume that BABIP and other certain peripherals are uh, not, I'm sorry, that are they are luck-based. BABIP is luck-based. And I think we'll get to uh, this in a little bit and um, you know discuss why maybe that's another faulty assumption. Uh, and the last of the, the big three is Sierra. Um, Skill Interactive ERA, I think this was made by Matt Swartz. Um, he's with MLB Trade Rumors. Um, he's the one who pre basically predicts arbitration salaries like spot on. Um, the formula is extremely complicated, um, but it is basically the same as XFIP, um, except it relies on interactions and nonlinear terms, as I mentioned here. And what that really means uh, to get away from the jargon is that um, these same elements of pitching performance do not necessarily exist in a vacuum. Um, a guy who strikes out a bunch of hitters and walks a bunch of hitters might have fundamentally the same Sierra, or I'm sorry, the same like XFIP or ERA as someone who walks and strikes out a small number of, of hitters. And that's just the way that the the weights for each of those variables are assigned to them. You can have someone with the same ERA estimator, but totally different skill sets. And what Sierra says is those different skill sets um, have a more complex relationship than something like FIP or XFIP is leading on. So it creates interaction. So it says, well, you have strikeouts and walks, but what about the coexistence of both of those at their specific magnitudes. So like a 30% strikeout weight rate, excuse me, and a 5% 5 uh, walk rate, you take both of those separately, but then you also combine them, essentially. You interact them, and that has its own weight assigned to it. And that creates um, some nonlinear um, effects, basically, in Sierra that help capture, um, I would say that it helps better capture the pitcher's skill set in, in, in a more theoretical sense. And the reason why the, the formula is so extremely complicated is that there's interactions with basically every variable in there. Strikeouts, um, there's a, a strikes, a strikeout rate squared, uh, strikeouts and walks combined, walks squared, you have fly balls and ground balls, and there's so much stuff involved. And again, its most useful purpose is predicting future performance, but the biggest takeaway from Sierra is that all the complexity that Sierra adds to XFIP doesn't really change our understanding of pitching skill. It does, I think it 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 captures certain nuances in certain players' skill sets, but by and large, for the average pitcher, Sierra doesn't actually really improve on XFIP, um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like that's not a, an indictment of Sierra. I think, it, as as someone who does this kind of stuff in his day job, I would say that Sierra's kind of theoretical basis is the most sound if we were trying to get to a place where we could predict future performance with one metric. Um, but with that said, the fact that all this complexity doesn't really add that much value is really a testament to FIP and to XFIP for using such a, a simple foundation and really creating so much value um, from the very start. All the Everything that we can learn from here on out after FIP or XFIP is really just chipping away um, at some smaller gains, but the big gains that have already been produced are in this one one metric, um, and that's pretty remarkable. Like I, I think you know, there's there's some people who will dismiss FIP for one reason or dismiss XFIP for another reason, and they really all have their merits for for different reasons. And you know, I again, I think I'll, I'll emphasize this later is that I. Uh, you know, there, there's really no right or wrong in terms of which one you're using. They should all be used just in in very, you know, in different ways. You should be using them strategically to um, not necessarily get the result that you want. That's cherry picking. But if you're using them and leveraging them the way that they're meant to be used, um, you can definitely improve um, your fantasy baseball experience. And I'm going to burp. OK, so um, <clears throat> excuse me. There are a couple of other ERA estimators as I was trying to like pull things together here. Um, there's a couple that are hidden on on fan graphs. There's true ERA. Um, I don't know actually what Quera, Quera, 
I don't know what that is. I mean, it's it's the K and the W stands for strikes, strikeouts and walks. So I called it strikeout walk ERA. I don't know if it has like a fancy, uh, you know, a fancy thing, a fancy lingo to it. Um, and they're both they're both uh, they're both okay. You know, I would not recommend any of them over FIP or XFIP. Um, I think they're um, again there there's just fundamentally different assumptions that are pretty interesting. Um, you know, strikeout walk ERA has probably the, the simplest um, formula of all of them. And it really only looks at strikeouts and walks. Um, and again, while that's a, a great foundation, um, there's a lot more involved to pitcher performance that is ownable. Again, I'm going to come back to the kind of the, the idea of owning skills. And, you know, we're going to, we're, I think we're going to show that like home runs or at least home run rates, that's an ownable skill. Um, BABIP, ownable skill. Um, Eventually, we're going to get to weighted on base average on contact, an ownable skill to some extent. Um, and so for the sake of comprehensiveness, I just kind of want to do a roundup and show the correlations of each of these metrics with ERA, um, same year ERA. And with same year ERA on a scale from zero to one, so zero being no relationship at all, one being a perfect match, um, FIP has the strongest relationship with same year ERA. Um, true ERA is second, and that's because true ERA um, is, I think this was developed in like 2010, um, so it's probably like just as old as FIP, um, really didn't have the same kind of granularity as data uh, as we do now. And so that's why its relationships with uh, ERA are pretty similar to that of FIP. You can see that with both the same year and the next year ERA. Um, and you can also see um, that XFIP and Sierra um, are weaker in terms of same year ERA um, but stronger ever so slightly with next year ERA. Uh, and really, I mean, looking at this, um, it's not it's not pretty in terms of predicting ERA. I mean, it's really um, it's really a crapshoot. <laughs> predicting ERA is a crapshoot. If we're trying to do it, it is very, very difficult, um, which almost makes me feel like we shouldn't do it at all. Um, but that is a defeatist attitude, so I will not say that. Because um, I do want to figure out how to better predict ERA. And I think we have some tools at our disposal um, and some kind of information that is coming to light more recently that helps us get to that point where we can maybe get our um, our R squared, our, our relationship with ERA, or next year ERA, above 0.2, which means that we'd explain roughly 20% of the variation in ERA, which is not very much, but it's better than nothing. Okay, come on. And that brings me to the present. And so I'm excited to share my... ERA estimator, which is called Deserved ERA. And I actually haven't published this yet. Um, I didn't publish it because um, StatCast released something called Expected ERA or XERA, and that's going to be on the next slide. Um, uh, it's actually not the same, which is uh, which is good because I thought it was, and I was like, all right, I just wasted a whole bunch of time doing this thing. And then they just, they just went and did it, and they're like way bigger than, than me. So, um, but Deserved ERA... Um, you know, I wanted to uh, kind of get to an ERA estimator that truly embodied one aspect of ERA estimation or the other. And when I say aspect, I mean, there's basically a spectrum of descriptive to predictive. And we, we've kind of seen that we have FIP closer to descriptive. Um, we have XFIP closer to predictive. They're both, in a sense, like trying to have one hand in each jar and I was like screw it let's let's get our hand in fully in one jar let's get it into the descriptive jar um, and I wanted to do that just using weighted on ba on base average on contact which is um, the average contact quality quality excuse me average contact quality allowed by a pitcher and that um, that goes beyond just home runs like FIP uses home runs and says that's an ownable skill, but nothing else about contact quality is. And I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, and I think, again, we're going to show some evidence that that's not true. So I wanted to use Wobicon, what weighted on base average on contact, um, to show that it could describe ERA better than any other um, <clears throat> expert. Yeah, I'm seeing all these comments. You guys are killing me. Um, these, uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm rattled now. Um, how Wobicon can um, better describe ERA better than any other um, metric that exists right now. 
And so um, the formula is here. Um, you can take a screenshot of it. I can provide it to um, Nick to you know disseminate this uh, presentation afterward. I'll eventually publish something about this just so there's there's some documentation of it at Fangraphs. Um, but basically, um, you're just using strikeout rates, walk rates, hit by pitch rate, and then instead of home runs, you're using weighted av on base average on contact. Um, and so um, you know you have to do a little bit of calculation on your own uh, if you're going to you know manually ca calculate these the way that other people do. Um, you know, you need to know the strikeout rate, the walk rate. You're going to have to manually ca calculate the hit by pitch rate. And then when you take the Wobicon, the weighted on base average on contact, um, instead of using that in its raw form, you're going to take it, let's say it's 350, as I've shown here. Um, and then you're going to multiply it by the percentage of plate appearances uh, or uh, yeah, yeah, plate appearances that end in a ball in play. So in this instance, you're saying, well, minus 36% of plate appearances that end in strikeouts and walks, that leaves us with 64% of plate appearances that result in this 350 Wobicon. Um, you plug all those in. Basically, I've described an elite pitcher here, and you can see that his deserved ERA um, would have been a 2.82 if he had a 30% strikeout rate, 6% walks and hits by pitch, and then a better than average Wobicon, he would be a better than three ERA. And moving on to the next slide, uh, again, most useful purpose is describing past performance. Um, and if we look at same year ERA, we've um, really just kind of blown the door wide open in terms of describing same year ERA. FIP did a good job. XFIP and Sierra, Sierra did an okay job. Deserved ERA does the best job, uh, for better or for worse. And for worse because, you know, it's important to emphasize that it's actually now least useful for predicting future ERA. Um, in terms of predicting next year ERA, it's actually worse than regular ERA. Um, so it's cool. It's like a, a thing that I did that shows that, um, you know, if we are trying to figure out what someone had deserved previously, um, you know, deserved ERA using weighted on base average on contact is probably the best, the best metric for this. Um, but you can also see that there's basically an inverse relationship between trying to make a metric descriptive and predictive. And again, that was kind of that spectrum I'm talking about. Um, as you veer more towards descriptiveness, you're going to lose your predictiveness and vice versa. Um, alas, there's a trade-off between those two. And so, um, you know, from a backward looking standpoint, if we're trying to determine what should have happened, um, like I said, Wobicon adds far more value than simply home runs. Um, and also contact quality um, is a spectrum. Wobicon um, is an average measure of contact quality, but that does not necessarily mean that two guys with the 350 Wobicon um, are allowing the same kind of uh, distribution of contact. Some guys might give up a lot of weak liners. I don't know. And the other guy might give up a lot of ground balls and a lot of home runs. I mean, Again, this is an average, and it doesn't really totally capture the total picture uh, of of a, of a pitcher's performance. Uh, but it is, you know, it's better than nothing. But what it really gets to in terms of this tug of war between descriptive and predictive is that, and to paraphrase Tom Tango, um, Tango Tiger, he wrote the book. Um, he's the Statcast guru at this point. Um, the the tug of war between descriptive and predictive is basically a um, a battle of attributing value to the play uh, or to the player. And so um, it's interesting to think about it this way because using Wobicon, using deserved ERA, even using something like FIP where it, it treats home runs as, on, as an ownable skill, that is coming much closer to describing the play. And again, the play is the home run um, as opposed to describing the player. Whereas again, XFIP uses fly balls, that is veering more toward the player in terms of the skill that's being owned as opposed to the home run. Um, this does imply that, uh, you know, I guess maybe X Wobicon would be an interesting use here instead of Wobicon. Maybe it could be substituted in for Wobicon kind of the way that X FIP uses fly balls instead of home runs for, for FIP and repurposes that. Um, we'll get to that in a little bit as well. Um, but anyway, I just, this is, this is an important thing to think about because I think, um, you know, as we move forward in terms of estimating ERAs, um, 
there's there's always going to be trade offs here in terms of what we're trying to de- trying to describe or or predict and and knowing again knowing what each one does is very helpful in terms of how you're going about evaluating uh, player performance. <clears throat> so getting to expected ERA, that was um, the new ERA estimator um, that Statcast developed. Um, I think they published it. <sighs> Uh, in March, maybe. Um, and here's the definition. I'm not going to read it to you, but effectively it's a simple one-to-one translation of XWOBA onto the ERA scale. So it basically, um, it, it, it's just, yeah, a one-to-one translation. I can't describe it any better than that. You're basically just running a regression between the two. Um, this regression will apply a weight to XWOBA, uh, and then it'll give you a constant term, and then you can just use those weights to... Um, convert that to ERA. Um, as they note here, it's not necessarily predictive, and XERA is actually very similar to FIP, and they acknowledge that here um, in the second paragraph. If you're familiar with FIP, um, uh, the idea is similar, just now that StatCast uh, stats can be used effectively. Um, and so in terms of predictiveness and descriptiveness, it is about as effective as FIP. Um, I want to say thanks to Dan Richards, who's a writer at PitcherList. Um, he actually dove into XERA in March, trying to see kind of, you know, what its merits were uh, relative to everything else. Um, and then lastly, um, getting to maybe like probably the closest we're getting to becoming more predictive is Connor Kirkon's um, predictive classified run average, PCRA. Um, it started as XRA. Um, he changed the name to CRA. Um, uh, and then he it originally started as a descriptive metric. And I think that descriptive metric was probably really similar to my deserved ERA. I think it um, had incorporated weighted on base average to some extent, um, or Wobacon, I should say, uh, and, and made the most descriptive ERA estimator today. I recall that being the case um, when they changed websites at six man rotation, they lost a lot of um, posts, unfortunately. So I can't actually read that first post where he unveiled descriptive CRA, but it doesn't really matter because PCRA is better. Um, what it assumes um, is basically it takes XFIP one step further. Um, XFIP, say hi, loons. Um, it takes uh, XFIP one step further, going um, from strikeouts, walks, and fly balls to strikeouts, walks, and barrels. And it's such a simple um, change, but it's so intuitive because you're getting past just the launch angle element of it. Fly balls, um, you know, home runs is the play. Uh, Fly balls is the skill owned by the player. But a fly ball is really only the launch angle element of this. A barrel is the combination of the launch angle and the exit velocity. So we're just adding an additional variable here, but without adding an additional variable. There's still only three, but we're incorporating more elements of um, kind of the player performance. And it is part of the play. The barrel is the play, but it is an ownable skill by the player. Um, And Connor justified using barrels because, um, again, they captured the essence of XWOBA or WOBACon, um, but they become reliable more quickly. So, um, you know, the idea that you could use XWOBACon in an ERA estimator um, is totally valid. But if barrels are going to basically capture the same thing, if barrels are highly correlated with XWOBA, but they become reliable more quickly, that makes it way better for using it in an ERA estimator. And where does it get us? Um, PCRA at this point is the most predictive ERA estimator that we have. Um, not by a ton, but still it is. Um, and that's kind of a big deal um, because we've been using the same ERA estimators for literally decades. Um, I don't know if it's decades. More than a decade? A decade and a half? And that brings us to the future. My throat is parched. What does the future hold? I don't know. It's not here yet. We have a lot of clues about what could be useful. Um, From PCRA, that is just one small, but at the same time, huge hint. It's so simple, um, but so intuitive and provides a lot of insight as to where we should all be headed with this stuff. Um, Tom Tango has shown that exit velocity is the most predictive element of hitter performance for pitchers. 
I'm sorry, for hitters. <laughs> element of hitter performance for pitchers. Oh my God. Um, it is the most predictive element of hitter performance. Um, so what does that mean for pitchers? There's gotta be some element of truth to that for pitchers. And it's been shown time and time again, that pitcher performance is a lot harder to nail down than, than hitter performance. It stabilizes less quickly. Um, it makes, again, that's why ERA is so difficult to project um, because the peripherals are hard enough to nail down and then having to determine outcomes based on these peripherals just becomes even more uh, of a crapshoot. Um, but we do know some things that can give us insight that aren't necessarily discardable. Um, we know that different pitch types allow fundamentally different qualities of contact on average. We know that similar pitches within a pitch type have fundamentally different effectiveness at varying velocities. And so, uh, and then again, um, you know, Connor's been working on more work. He has recently unveiled uh, a metric called dynamic hard hit rate, where instead of saying anything over this threshold, this uh, exit velocity threshold is a hard hit, um, it uses launch angle to determine that threshold. So that threshold might be lower at certain angles. It might be higher at other angles, higher at an angle where um, really the exit velocity doesn't really matter. Um, there are certain angles where um, a, a fly liner, a fly liner, a weak liner um, invariably becomes a hit no matter what. Um, exit velocity shouldn't matter as much there. Um, meanwhile, you know, a sky high fly ball or a ripped, um, like a line drive grounder, um, think about uh, Vlad Guerrero Jr. Um, exit velocity is huge there. Um, because it, it tells us a lot about the capacity of that hitter um, without um, maybe without the the results to show for it. So we have some breadcrumbs and I just kind of want to walk you through some visualizations to to really capture um, what I'm getting at here. And this is a table that I presented um, at First Pitch Arizona um, in November. Um, I've added a lot of circles. Um, they're color coded for your convenience. And it's just to show that the average pitch by pitch type performs very differently. Um, you can see that the weighted on base average on contact for a changeup in 2019 was more than 70 points lower than a fastball. That's an enormous difference. And I know that there will be people who say, well, StatCast doesn't actually classify that pitch the right way. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I don't really care if I'm being honest. It's uh, one of those things that like it, it, it affects a few pitchers. I know it affects like, I don't know, Zach Wheeler, a guy who like doesn't actually have a four seamer and a two seamer. Like, sure. That's a, th a small nuance where like, I can see that it makes some modicum of difference, but generally speaking, when we look at this table, we can see how much more effective off speed pitches and breaking pitches are than fastballs. The average four seam fastball, and we're talking about the average pitcher, um, allows an exit velocity that's like nearly five miles per hour higher than the average changeup. Um, fastballs are huge launch angle pitches. They allow tons of barrels. They allow very little weak contact. They allow tons of pop ups, which is great. Um, but overall, you know, when they don't get whiffs um, and they allow tons of hard contact, that hard contact manifests itself in a higher ERA, like that is effectively what I'm trying to show with deserved ERA is that throwing a pitch like a bad fastball way too often will result in bad outcomes. And this is intuitive. We know this just fundamentally, just as baseball fans, as people who have watched enough baseball, um, just even me explaining this to you, you're like, no shit, this is, excuse me, bleep it, bleep it live. Um, no, no, duh, this is real. Um, but sometimes we need the numbers just to, to really understand how important these differences can be. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of green circles here. Nick's going to be very upset at how many green circles there are for splitters. Um, I, I will say that splitters are a little harder to nail down just because um, there just aren't enough of them thrown. Um, and the guys who throw them overall don't have good results. So there's an interesting catch 22 there. Um, but change ups, like I think um, I might be jumping a little too far ahead into my presentation here, but you know, it would be really good to have an elite fastball, but I think it's also pretty dope to try to develop a really good change up or a really good slider, uh, definitely a really good change up. Um, and I know 
that all of these things interact with one another, and we'll get to that in a second too. Um, I know we can he and ha over um, you know how pitchers' arsenals play play up or play down certain pitches, but it's not really important to me at this moment. So I wanted to just look into this a little more closely. This is what we call a cumulative distribution. You're like, why the hell is he showing me this? This is nonsense. Um, this is of exit velocity. Um, and what this is showing is basically, um, you can see um, at any percentage on the left side, if you trace it over, it tells you basically at this specific percentage is uh, this velocity threshold. So everything above that is a higher velocity and everything below it is a lower velocity. No, no duh, as, the, as one would say, who doesn't cuss? So I want to zoom in on the 50% mark. That's the median. Um, and these are all the different lines in this chart. Um, we're, we're just focused right here on all these lines that are kind of pushed together. Um, what you really want to see from a pitch is its line pushed as far left as possible. You want as much space underneath the curve as possible, or um, conversely, as little space above the curve as possible. Uh, and so you can see I've drawn little red dashed lines um, from each of these colored lines showing at 50%, so at the median, what the median exit velocity for each of these pitches are. At, uh, at the median for changeups, the median changeup velocity, exit velocity, excuse me, is less than 86 miles per hour. The median exit velocity for a uh, forcing fastball is more than 91 miles per hour. And so what that's saying is more than 50% of batted balls from or off of uh, four seam fastballs are above 91 miles per hour, whereas only or 50% or of batted balls against changeups are above 86 miles per hour. That's a huge difference. That's a huge difference. That's saying that half of the balls that changeups allow are below 86 miles per hour. And this actually might be better to communicate from a different perspective. Let's jump to using exit velocity instead. Uh, if we use the cumulative uh, distribution and look at the 95 mile per hour threshold, so I'm going to go to 95 miles per hour, I'm going to trace that straight up and find where that intersects with each of these lines. You can see that only 62% of four seam fastballs allow balls in play that are softer than 95 miles per hour. Whereas if you trace it all the way to the top for changeups, basically 73% of balls in play against changeups are softer than 95 miles per hour. That's a 10 to 11 percentage point difference between these two pitches. And we're talking about basically, if we're going hard hit rate, if we're talking about hard hit rate as the threshold of 95 miles per hour, the hard hit rate for the average forcing fastball compared to the changeup is 10 or 11 percentage points higher. So if you are the average pitcher and you have the average performance for every pitch, you absolutely want to use a different pitch that's not a forcing fastball. Not saying that you discard the forcing fastball completely, but nearly every pitcher in the league can afford to make some kind of adjustment to his arsenal based on this information. And what I'm trying to get at here is that... Um, you know, there are some blind spots to these ERA estimators. Um, we're talking about strikeouts and walks as skills. We're talking about maybe home runs as skills or maybe fly balls as skills. And um, everything else is not a skill. Um, everything else is luck. BABIP is a luck. But we can see from this previous table that the average changeup allows a 270 BABIP. And the average two-seam fastball allows a 316 BABIP. Um, so again, not every pitcher is average, especially the elite pitchers are not going to be average. The very worst pitchers are going to be worse than average. But on average, these pitches do not necessarily perform to the league average. We should maybe be developing pitch-specific thresholds when we're talking about ERA estimators in the future. Fast forwarding back to home runs, um, home run to fly ball rate by velocity. So I, I just put this together real quick. I wanted to show what home run to fly ball rates look like at different velocities for different pitches. And you can see that generally speaking, better velocity leads to better outcomes, at least in terms of home runs. Um, there's an interesting relationship here with uh, curves and sliders. Really slow sliders look really good 
I don't know what the deal with that is. And also really slow curves are really bad. And maybe that's just a movement thing. Maybe that's just like a, a horizontal versus vertical movement thing. Easier to track, harder to track. I really don't know. It could just be noise. Um, but you can also see why there's a premium placed on hard, you know, on velocity. You can see that these three lines at the top right, um, the blue line, the orange line, the gray line, those are sinkers. Um, they are four seam fastballs. They're two seam fastballs. They all improve in terms of suppressing home runs as velocity increases, generally speaking. Um, do you want to throw sinkers? I don't know. They allow tons of home runs despite being ground ball pitches. That's a really interesting outcome. Um, I understand that there's a launch angle element there and you're trying to allow ground balls, but sinkers allow a ton of home runs, which is kind of, it's a, it's a weird paradox. It's another one of those catch 22s, but more so more, more than home runs. I want to look at, um, deserved what deserved ERA by velocity. And so, um, again, deserved ERA is my metric and it is accepting strikeouts, walks and contact quality as skills. And so, you know, using an ERA estimator for a pitch is very flawed. Um, I don't actually recommend anyone doing this necessarily. Um, and that's because, um, you know, pitch sequencing is a huge deal. Um, a lot of four seam fastballs thrown in zero, zero counts. Um, you know, that, that improves ultimately like the, the quality of fastballs simply because they're getting lots of strikes in counts where there are not swings. Um, you know, breaking balls and off-speed pitches are going to be thrown more in two-strike counts unless you know you have an elite fastball, like unless you're a Jacob deGrom or a Justin Verlander or a Garrett Cole, someone like that who can blow by a fastball on a two-strike count and feel really confident about it. Otherwise, everyone's throwing, you know, breaking stuff or off-speed stuff in two-strike counts. Um, so using this kind of metric is not the best, the best kind of like way to capture this idea, but it certainly serves as a really effective proxy and you can see that basically at at every velocity pretty much every pitch is improving in terms of striking out more guys possibly allowing fewer walks cannot necessarily attest to that because command is a huge element here that's not being captured very well in era estimators again something we'll get to in a little bit uh and contact quality contact quality is huge for fastballs because they allow terrible contact quality so the better a fastball can be usually, I'm sorry, the better, uh, the higher velocity of fastball is generally speaking, the better um, batted ball outcomes it'll allow, at least for the pitcher. Incidentally, you basically have to have an elite four seamer or an elite sinker or an elite two seamer in terms of velocity to even have like a break even or a league average outcome on those pitches. Again, in average, on average, um, the elite pitchers will beat this. But if you're talking about the average pitcher, he has to have a 99 mile per hour fastball for his fastball to be basically EV plus, which is kind of a term that we use to say that it has a positive expected value. Whereas all of the breaking balls and off-speed pitches have their entire line, <laughs> the entire line at every single vo uh, velocity bucket is below the league average. Um, and so again, there are interactions here. Look, I get it. <laughs> I get it. The various pitches in a pitcher's arsenal play off one another, but nearly all pitchers can improve from a change in arsenal because off-speed pitches and breaking pitches are so superior to fastballs. Um, and again, re-emphasizing, fastballs affect the effectiveness of the off-speed and breaking pitches and vice versa. But again, there are definitely gains that can be made uh, for every, basically every pitcher in the league. But anyway, let's get back to the point. If exit velocity is the most predictive element of hitter contact quality, there stands to reason that the same can be said of pitchers too, who allow consistent, harder, soft contact. Um, these patterns exist on both sides of the ball. They can't exist for hitters and not pitchers. Um, and this is my favorite graph. And this is just me throwing shade. I love throwing shade. Um, this is me comparing the cumulative distribution of exit velocities between uh, Kyle Hendricks, who's the blue line, uh, and Shane Bieber, who's the orange line. Um, Kyle Hendricks uh, will allow, let me see, at his median, his median exit velocity allowed is like 80, 88. 
uh, Shane Bieber's is 93. So basically, like, half of Kyle Hendricks' balls in play, excuse me, <clears throat> are below 88 miles per hour. Basically, half of the balls in play against Shane Bieber are hard hits. Like, almost classifiably by by stat cast definition of a hard hit, almost half the balls in play against Shane Bieber are a hard hit. That's really bad. That's really insane. Um, and I want to go to this next one because I'm just throwing more shade. I actually plotted all 10 of the top 10 starting pitchers um, by NFBC ADP in terms of their exit velocity the last two years. Guess which one the orange line is? <clears throat> it's Shane Bieber. Um, the yellow line on top, you can actually maybe see that one barely. That's actually Jacob deGrom, <clears throat> which if you had to ask me if I had to pick between Garrett Cole and Jacob deGrom, um, I think you can't really go wrong with either one. But if I'm going to err, like if I have to split hairs, if I absolutely have to split hairs, Jacob deGrom is better at limiting hard contact than than Garrett Cole is. Um, Garrett Cole has a whiff-tastic fastball, but Jacob deGrom gets whiffs and also limits hard contact in a very spectacular way. So um, this is just kind of like a visualization of, of why I would make these decisions in the first round. Um, and also why I'm never going to, I mean, I love Shane Bieber as much as the next guy. Um, I would have preferred to him for him being a, the 35th starter off the board, like he was in 2018 um, or in 2019. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, <clears throat> no, I, um, you know, People say that they're going to take him over, over Clevenger or Flaherty, um, and I will show them this. So, anyway, getting back to the point again. Um, so it stands to reason that because we have a lot of evidence that various pitch types uh, at various um, velocities perform, perform sounds like I almost said porn, uh, perform very differently. Um, and if we can zero in on pitcher usage and the specs associated with those pitches. Um, we can determine the ways in which current ERA estimators fail us. So I think, um, you know, ERA estimators as they are, are very helpful, but you can also look to a pitcher's arsenal and see exactly why those ERA estimators um, are failing us and kind of pinpoint exactly, um, you know, kind of with concrete evidence where those can improve or, you know, why so-and-so should be or should not be um, beating his estimators. I think there's plenty of room to uh, to to make those arguments um, with all the element or all the uh, evidence um, available to us. Um, and just just speaking generally about the future, uh, we we focus so much time on trying to um, find a predictive metric for contact quality, and yet we always assume that strikeouts and walks are a fixed skill. We assume that the 30% strikeout rate from 2018 will carry over into 2019. Not necessarily like you and me saying like, we know it's going to be exactly the same, but the way that the ERA estimators work, their inherent assumptions are that uh, the 30% mark is it. It is as is. It does not change. And that is the skill that will be carried over into the next year. And that is in itself a faulty, um, a faulty assumption. And I think if, we want to improve ERA estimators going forward. We're going to actually have to project strikeouts and walks too. And then at a certain point, we're just straight up creating projection systems. So now do I have to draw the line and say like, well, maybe we don't actually have to get this far with ERA estimators. Maybe what we have is good enough. Um, maybe we just need to make a couple more tweaks like what Connor has done. Uh, and then just know that they will not necessarily work for everyone. Uh, and you have to know where their faults are. And you can use the data available to us to identify those faults and know why certain guys are going to be better or worse. Um, you know, maybe that's maybe that's just where we end up. Maybe we, we can't all just create projections. Uh, but, you know, I think it would be interesting to see an ERA estimator that instead of using strikeouts and walks, uses more peripherals like swinging strike rate, um, uses things like whiffs per swing or or really like edge rate or edge percentage, something, some kind of command-based element, something that gets away from the outcome, which is the play. We're talking about the play versus the player, and really the strikeouts and walks are the play. Um, and while there's a lot less variance involved with strikeouts and walks, I think if we're getting closer to the quote-unquote player, 
um, we're going to maybe move away from strikeouts and go towards swing strike rates as part of our ERA estimators, go towards edge percentage, go towards anything like that that can quantify these skills without relying, again, on the quote-unquote, as Tom calls it, the play. But ultimately, I think um, the next step forward, among all these other things that I mentioned, is maybe blending the you know uh, blending elements of the existing ones. And I think I've I've implied this, um, but I think really you know we want to focus on um, weak contact as an ownable trait. Um, but those results are hard to predict. We want to focus on hard contact as an ownable trait in a bad way, uh, with results that are easier to predict. I think that we shouldn't be treating all balls in play the same way within an ERA estimator. I think that there's room to distinguish between those and create more robust results. Um, and it's possible that certain pitchers are allowing hard contact at good angles for them or bad contact at bad angles. Uh, and what I mean by that is like, again, I mentioned that there are certain angles where like almost every line drive becomes a hit, no matter the exit velocity. So you can, <clears throat> allow a 70 mile per hour line drive and it'll still become a hit whereas you can allow a 100 mile per hour ground ball and it might be an out and there are certain pitchers who can probably repeat that pattern uh and beat quote unquote beat these era estimators um because they're so good at consistently doing that i think there's probably room to figure out or you know to try to identify these pitchers and um help build era estimators to better capture their skill sets um, so really, I think when I'm talking about the play, play to player kind of spectrum, um, you know, maybe ultimately we're not talking about the players, um, but we're talking about their pitches and the pitches being um, the linchpins to these future ERA estimators. So now that I've nearly lost my voice, um, I really appreciate everyone for, for joining in today. Um, thanks for tolerating my stumbling around. Um, I hope you've learned something. If you haven't learned something, I hope you've, uh, I don't know laughed at my expense or something gotten some value out of it um my raffle prize is a custom pitch leaderboard um uh i again nick mentioned that i'm i'm the custom i'm the pitch leaderboard guy um i can make you a custom one i can make some other custom tableau dashboard so um this is a very nuanced prize if that's something that you're interested in go ahead and throw your hat in the ring um but you know above all please continue to donate um we're very appreciative of everyone's generosity and again thanks to nick and pitcher list for for having me as as part of the panel uh, nick are you here oh yeah alex that was fantastic man thanks i had no idea you're going to debut a new era in front of us here oh my god i didn't either <laughs> before three days ago <laughs> oh that was awesome um i actually have, I have one specific question one thing that really struck me with this um, it was the chart, essentially, you're showing that all secondary pitches are just better than fastballs, right? Mm -hmm. And the one the thing that really stuck out to me was that um, curveballs for knuckle curve and curveball, as you increase the velocity, the DRA like tanked massively, mm -hmm. right? And we're talking like 84 miles per hour, I think was the highest one. And it was just like a one DRA for that. Yeah. Um, are we, should we be putting more stock into like a guy that has like an 83 or 84 mile per hour curveball then? Yeah, I think so. Like the like the power curve or like the you know the right. hammer curve or the power slider like when Thor used to throw that like ninety two mile per hour slider like that thing was just pure filth and it probably played up his fastball too which was already hmm. pretty filthy you know so I think like you know you can't just go out and tell a guy like yeah you go develop a power curve like that's definitely like a certain only a certain guy can can do that but I think. Right. You know, I, I think you definitely I, I'm not a scout. I don't know how scouts necessarily grade pitches um, through and through. But, you know, if if I see a guy throwing like an 86 mile per hour curve, I might just automatically slap a 70 on it or something, because that just has massive potential, like just regardless of regardless of his command, even mm -hmm. regardless of the outcomes on it. Like it's hard to tell, you know, during the in the minors, you don't have really have that granular of data. But if you see it, an 85, 86 mile per hour curve, if you see a 92 mile per hour slider, that has the potential to be truly elite. Well, it, it, I mean, it makes me think of like, okay, so if we take, um, if we have a certain pitcher and we have like a certain expected array, but he also has an 84 mile per hour curveball, is that something that we should be throwing into these estimators? Like how much can we start incorporating actual repertoire into, into these things? That's what I hope is like the next step. Like yeah. I really think that we can, I think that we can really 
because we we can see on average that there are such different effects for different pitches that we should be mm -hmm. able to say um you know where maybe we're at, at a certain point we're making era estimators for each pitch and then combining those into one big era right. estimator like i don't really know what it looks like and that's it might be beyond my expertise um it might be left to someone who's maybe just smarter than i am who's on the stack cast team who does machine learning stuff there's things mm -hmm. that are my cats are fighting. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, no, I think I think you know we we have enough data to say that like we just can't we can't keep assuming that BABIP is going to be three hundred. We can't keep assuming that home run rates are equal for everyone um, or regress back to the league average. Like there are definitely nuances in every every mm -hmm. pitcher's arsenal based on his velocity, based on the pitches that he's choosing to use, based on where he's spotting those pitches. Like we can definitely we can definitely enhance these ERA estimators to account for these these nuances. Right. Yeah, maybe PitchCon 2021 will have something for that. <laughs> uh, Buster Cat has a pretty good question. Um, he asked if I can get up to it again. Here we go. Uh, Alex, have you addressed the inherent lower EV off the bat from off-speed pitches? It was brought up a little bit earlier. Have I addressed them? I don't know. Uh, I mean, uh, I think that just – it just I, I don't know what the question is necessarily. But, um, yeah, I think uh, just intuitively, like, it's probably easier to hit a straight pitch than a curvy pitch. Um, you know, so um, even a, even a bad bender is better than a good fastball typically. And again, there's going to be relationships between all the pitches in a pitcher's arsenal. His fastball will play up his curve. His curve might play up his fastball, mm -hmm. but just generally right. speaking, like, you know, I think um, it's going to be harder to square up something that's moving and it's going to be even harder to square up something that's moving and moving fast at the same time. Right. Um so it just it just stands to reason that we are trying harder to incorporate these 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 values into these ERA estimators, or at the very least, if we're not going to change anything, to go into these and say like this is very clearly where this ERA estimator is failing us because this guy has a power curve that will absolutely limit hard contact and it should keep his his BABIP mm -hmm. down. And we kind of already do that in our our analysis, but it'd be nice to right. have an ERA estimator that does that for us. Yeah, that's um, like the major disconnect that we have right now right. is that we have the ERA, but then we talk about all the nuance of it. It's like, wait, can't we figure out some sort of middle ground there? Right. Uh, we have maybe one more question. Uh, <laughs> um, Eric the Orange wants to know, Alex, what's your favorite Every Time I Die album? Um, it's probably Hot Damn. Um, it's a, That's an oldie but goodie, but I've, I really, um, New Junk Aesthetic was really good. Low Teens was really good. Um, those are probably my three favorite, but Hot Damn is um, is too good to pass up. That one's a banger um, through and through. Nice. Um, for all wait, the wait. Arizona Die fans out there. <laughs> well, anyway, Alex, thank you so much uh, for doing Thanks, this. It's fantastic. Uh, Two-time Fantasy Sports Writer Award winner Alex Chamberlain, and really thank you so much uh, for joining us for PitchCon. Thank you, pal. Um, <laughs> keep me posted on things, but I, good luck with everything today. You guys are doing a great job, and it's incredible that you're already at like twenty five hundred dollars or whatever through. It blows three, my mind. Three really. hours. It, it, um, it's, it's absolutely crazy. So. so through three days, hopefully we'll reach a million. I know there that you said that if you don't reach a million, you're going to shave your head again. Hey, um, I remember um, you making that promise. Um, but <laughs> but if you don't make it to a million, it's okay. I'm not going to be upset. Um, if we make it to a million, I guarantee we'll have that. Pitch.